This is GamesAtWork.biz, your weekly podcast about gaming, technology, and play. Your hosts are Michael Martin, Andy Piper, and Michael Rowe. The thoughts and opinions on this podcast are those of the hosts and guests alone and are not the opinions of any organization which they have been, are, or may be affiliated with. This is episode 475. Hello, friend. Hello and welcome again, friend, to this edition of GamesAtWork.biz. This is Michael Martin rejoining after a bit of a hiatus uh, with my friends, plural, uh, Andy Piper and Michael Rowe. Michael, how the heck are you today? Welcome back, Michael. It's great to have you back, uh, and I am doing quite well. I'm excited for this show. And Andy, how are you? I'm good. Yes, it's been quite a week on the internet of uh, strange memes and news and announcements and possibly some new thinking or maybe some old thinking masquerading as new thinking with certain products, but we'll, we'll come <laughs> on to that. <laughs> everything old is new again. Exactly. <laughs> well, or everything new is old again. Maybe that too. That uh, works too. So, so we've got some intriguing articles that Michael, I, I have to imagine, captured your attention right from the beginning because not just because they're leveraging the Apple Vision Pro, but uh, that is a certainly a start here. And the first one, um, a- Andy, you're normally the guy who finds the Hackaday articles, uh, is one around telepresence and using VR headsets to help you visualize how you're commanding and controlling a robot that could be miles and miles away doing things right there in front of you so did i guess right andy this came from you yes yes indeed (laughs) yeah yes i'm so predictable uh it's quite useful uh so the this is a project uh it's on uh, github but the the story is on hackaday um where you can it's for you from uc san diego um and you could go uh, check out some some interesting videos of what they're doing with this, uh, these pairs of devices, but they are using a basically a remote robot, and you connect to it and you have control of it, and that's usually a little complicated because obviously uh, you know you need to be able to accurately see what you're doing and so on. But with the Apple Vision Pro and the gesture movements. The idea is that um, and they were collaborating here with uh, folks at MIT that uh, they get this really uh, accurate, evidently, and real-time stereo video, uh, which enables them to, to do this operation. Uh, the technology here is open source, which is quite exciting. Michael, you were going to say something. Yeah, I was going to say the other thing that I found really interesting about this um, was... One of the things that a lot of people don't like about the Vision Pro is it doesn't have hand controllers, right? Mm -hmm. But because it doesn't and it's instrumented to use your actual hands, the the interaction where the telepresence robot is doing stuff can have fully articulated finger movements. So they could actually do remote manufacturing a thing in one of their examples, which I thought was actually really cool. And it made me think of some of the early telepresence robots that we talked about. Gosh, I don't even remember how long ago, where it was an iPad on a stick. Yeah, iPad (laughs) on a stick. Right? Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, it's, it's amazing to see one... Not only the articulation, two, not only the stereoscopic vision, but three, the latency, the low latency in interaction. Yeah, and, and when they're doing the um the the chemical pipette kind of transfer of fluids, I thought that was pretty cool too. Especially when you consider this provides a, uh, an ability to do things that are would otherwise be in dangerous conditions, right? So if you're having to put out level five uh, containment lab, yeah, level five containment lab, or you have to deal with uh, a an, uh, an exposure for radiation, or 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 this would be easy, safe ways to go and handle My- these sort of situations, right? My brother actually works in a level five containment lab, so, so uh, you know, full monkey suit. Is right? he a listener? He needs to be a listener. Yeah. Read Hackaday. I'm sure he's heard of the show. <laughs> Once or twice, right? 
Um, so, yeah, so the next cool. one that's up though, Michael had you written all over it because this uh, is very, very similar to a topic we've covered a multitude of times about controlling devices with human brain interfaces. And this one's around Neuralink and Apple Vision Pro. So it's it's not Neuralink. Yeah, this this reminded me of some of the early oh, stuff that uh, I did with Emotive. Yes. Right, uh, and and you know, I still have two different emotive headsets. I don't I don't use them at all anymore. Uh, and I did look at some of the early um, accessibility features of the Vision Pro, uh, which are extensive. Uh, the The interesting part here is the fact that uh, the the person in this case is actually using a not Neuralink. It's they're Synchron. Synchron, right? They're, they're competitor uh, that doesn't require the brain interface to be physically cut open your skull, but actually snakes it up through the veins in your neck. Because that's just uh, so much better. Much better. S- significantly better. Yeah, uh, I mean, but, opening but your cool jugular is, would, would be, still be terrifying to me. What could possibly go. go wrong? Yeah, but it's better than having your head carved open and, and, and wires stuck in that can slip out like they have, right? Okay. But... But the, the interesting part here, though, is the fact that they're able to get enough sensory input with that kind of mesh that they're putting up through the vein uh, to to get enough information for the interface to be able to provide what you need for the Vision Pro to interact, right? And so uh, this person cannot use their hands at all. Uh, so they're not able to do the select function and the typing function. And while you can use your voice and you can use your eyes and you can use all this other stuff, uh, the ability to have that level of motor control based off of thought is pretty cool. Well, that's what I well, wanted to poke with you on, Michael, because you've had enough experience now with the Vision Pro. Can you do most everything that you want to do with the vision aspect of it and with your gaze to operate the device? Yeah. I mean, you still so, need to select. Yeah. Well, so this so has got me thinking about a few things. First of all, the tally presence story that we talked about previously is all about upper body mm-hmm. movement. There is no lower body movement. Uh, there is yep. no evidence of that robot moving from the table where it's standing to do the work or do the movements it's doing. The other interesting thing Makes about sense. that is that it, it's open source and uh, also works with the MetaQuest, and they've put some demos of that, although differently. This is focused on the Vision Pro, and I had the same thought as you, Michael, about the fact, well, hold on. If, you can, if you've can, if you got eye movement, then you can arguably start to, and you, mind you, you need the hands to do the selection um, or do, you know, do the actual interaction. Um, you, you, can, you can use the Vision Pro regardless. But I was also thinking about the fact that there was a story this week, which we don't have in the list, about a new patent that Apple's applied for that suggested that um, they're bringing the Vision Pro uh, gestures or user interface uh, features to the Mac and the iOS devices as well. So they've already got yep. this highly accurate eye tracking to know where you're paying attention. Um, in the future, could you be using that a lot more? So I think there's an interesting continuum of things there. I think it's really exciting to see a new technology uh, like the Vision Pro being used in this kind of a way to, in conjunction with advanced biotech, to help people. My immediate thought on the Neuralink thing, first of all, is that the CNBC headline, of course, puts Neuralink in there because more people have heard of Neuralink yeah, than anyone else. Exactly. Neuralink rival. <laughs> but knowing Musk's relationship to Apple, uh, I wouldn't have thought that they would be jumping at that opportunity for partnership at all. So, yeah, I think um, there's a there's a series of things there. Uh, Michael's obviously um, really keen to get his uh, his body, his his jugular opened to to have this new uh, implant put in. So, the, 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 there's there's one really, and, and Andy, you kind of hinted at it in your continuum. W- one of the key things about making for accessible devices and software is it makes it better for everyone, right? Right. It's, it's not just an accessibility thing. And that's one thing that uh, a mantra that I've tried to live out with with stuff for years. I, I, I wrote an article uh, for a magazine called um, Enable Magazine back in the mid-90s 
around accessibilities and operating systems, doing a comparison between Windows 95 and, and OS 2 and stuff. And many of those features that were radically accessible features back then are now just base functionality that everybody benefits from. And so seeing things like, if I can use eye tracking, regardless of my platform to better control my devices, that's better for everybody, right? Um, the selection mechanism could be, you know, if you're like Stephen Hawkins, right? He he had the mouth thing that you blew into, right? Uh, or, or, or voice. No, no, it was, it was, um, I should, he was Christopher, it. Christopher Reeves had the mouth thing. Right. Uh, so as a way of selecting stuff, but those types of features could be used in other contexts. If I'm in a, a radiation area where I have to be very locked down and stuff, right? I may need to have some of those quote accessibility features to, to do things. So I, I just find all this fascinating and it's great to see these types of examples. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree. At the same time, the experience with the emotive headset too was also very revolutionary at the time. I haven't taken mine out to use it in eons either, Michael, same as you. But what I really liked about it was it was not intrusive. Well, and, well, Michael wouldn't be able to put it on because it would interfere with his Vision Pro. So, well, <laughs> there know. is that. Depends on which headset. Yeah, <laughs> it, it it does. Yeah, the the Model Two, you know, would have this some was, better things. But these things are all about again. We all about the upper body. Let's let's move well, on and look at the lower body. Oh yeah, let's yes. let's do. Um, that was well attempted, and we just derailed that 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 transition. <laughs> Well, it's it's easy because we all had things that we wanted to say. So, Andy, that was that was a lovely segue into these pants that um, that you can wear now that will help hikers get where they need to go. These mountain, what are the mountain goat? Yeah, at Mogos. Mm -hmm. um, and Michael, I think you found this, and we had something mm -hmm. very similar to this already a, a little while We've ago. We've had didn't lots we? of exoskeletons yeah. that I'm we sure talked that about. What's What's interesting about this is the device itself. While it's kind of expensive, uh, forty five hundred dollars is the estimate right now on the pre orders. Um, is it literally is a a set of of pants that the the added weight of the exoskeleton component and its ability to improve your stride make it actually feel lighter <laughs> than not having them on. Uh, and so it's designed for a couple of hours worth of, of, of hike boosting or power boosting while you're walking. Um, and it, I can imagine in a strenuous hiking area if you're trying to attract a, a less athletic crowd, you might rent these out as an option. That's a good idea. Good thought. Yeah. I was just thinking, I, I know our friend Ian, he Predator Hughes has uh, got a large number of headsets and I think he's also uh, gone in for a number of these Kickstarters. So I can just imagine that, you know, like Tony Stark, he's got, you know, the room with all the suits where he just goes in and selects <laughs> which exoskeleton and which headset today to, to go yeah. with his activity. Well, I, I'm going to kind of defer from you guys a little bit. I find this goofy, to be honest. And being somebody who does a lot of hiking and a lot of very but strenuous hiking. It's not targeted for you. It's goofy well, because look. it might not be targeted for me, but you still need to have electricity for it, right? Even if it's a lightweight no, motor. It's chargeable. Yeah, yeah, you're in the woods, dude. You know how much three hours, charging three hour you're charging. really going to do. It's a small hike, strenuous small hike, and, and uh, you're targeting people who don't hike a lot and you want to give them the opportunity to experience that wonderful quality quiet out in the middle of the woods while the robot legs go goofy 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 goofy, goofy. <laughs> look michael you're gonna miss out on the uh, early bird discount of yeah uh, yes the, the down from from five thousand dollars to forty five hundred dollars i mean come on i i was i was gonna go for it but the, you know by two that was like yeah that's a little much so at, at the heads at the apple vision pro so you can look at some yeah. kind of beautiful vista and the emotive headset i would just want to send my robot to go on the hike for me so i don't even need these pants i could just sit and in my can home, sit at home with the vision, pro the vision on, pro, and, and let the robot it. hike for me and enjoy the presence. mountain scene and then when you come across some some kind of activity you've got the telepresence upper body that you can do connect yeah. to and there we are so, so we can do all this with texts and images already. So moving yes. right into our AI segment. See, so see, that was a nice segue here too. We have an example of how might you have a story written for you 
and interact with the story and not a choose your own adventure kind of moment, although there is an aspect of choose your own adventure with a um, way of using deep game to create your story. And Michael, you're just and Andy will really jump in. Yeah. To, to me, Andy, is this what your friend was working on? Because you you were playing a a, a chat GPT we, game. And we talked about it last. We week, talked so about this, this exactly awesome. last week. So we did, but that was <laughs> that was much more, um, yeah, much less than this, and because this has got the uh, the Dali visualization stuff in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's got uh, a lot of uh, other interesting elements to it. But yeah, absolutely. I think we've we've seen. Gosh, a few several months ago, within the last eighteen months that ChatGPT has been a thing, but within the last several months, uh, we we looked. I think Michael Martin, you looked in initially at using ChatGPT to play a D and D style game, right? And yep. this is going uh, further and providing uh, a lot more, um, yeah, uh, visual uh, interest. Having said that, this this game itself was available since uh, November 2023. So presumably, uh, if, if they've updated it to use later versions of the G- ChatGPT model, um, then it could have got a lot more sophisticated over time. Well, and, and the article itself is all about nudging the AI to escape its guardrails a bit too, right? So the author of this particular story is talking about, well, as opposed to, um, what is it? The, the ethics of good storytelling, which is what it's describing. Uh, how might you try to, um, pierce the veil, so to speak of those guardrails and take the story in a direction that maybe wasn't necessarily intended, which is kind of sort of a little bit like the Gandalf experience that we had all played not too long ago about getting the AI to reveal the password to you, right? How, how might you go about nudging the AI in a direction that it wasn't really intended to do necessarily, but you can make it happen anyhow. Interesting stuff. And that comes back to the story we talked about last week with the uh, Baldur's Gate um, branching um, factors and things that you need. So, um, yeah, this is this, this yeah. is very similar. Kind and of and I love that. Concepts. I love that yeah, because the yeah, developers sure. there were like, look, we're going to reward you from pushing the boundaries, which is all about yeah. what games are yeah. supposed to do. It's it's not creating a scenario. But they also need to do a ton of thinking up front to, right. pr- to determine yeah. what could go wrong, what could change, what could cause their master plan to get to go off off which, the rails or, well, which of course that has a soft- defined ending which is an effective approach to software development in general if you understand your boundaries your guardrails and you think of the possible out things you'll great generate appropriate tests to address them and you'll have a defined outcome that you need or to or case. to just foreshadow a little bit for the rest of the show if you seed an idea as it comes along it might actually get picked up and nudge people nah. in that direction to go take use of it. <laughs> so I, I'm very excited to learn a little bit more about this next story. And Andy, I think this is one that you've got some thoughts and experiences on. Uh, there's a new a new website called friend.com. Sounds very, very friendly, doesn't it? Yeah, I think I shared the uh, link initially and I'd seen it that day because people started to share it on Mastodon and said, you know, this must be a joke kind of a thing. And it very quickly turned out not to be a joke. Um, So this is a new device, uh, the Friend, uh, which is just kind of like a a, a much larger size Apple AirTag in terms of its format. It's just a kind of a little little pebble style thing that you wear, carry with you all the time. And it, it carries an AI personality you talk to it, it's meant to be encouraging in some way. It's meant to be, you know, um, this thing that that you can talk to if you need some uh, advice or you need some encouragement. And uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know what to think about it. It feels, a le- it feels less than what the rabbit um, has tried to do and the humane uh, Mm -hmm. pin has tried to do in the sense that they're not trying to be these things that can do lots of actions. It's much more leaning into the emotional angle of what we're building with um, large language models and AI. 
Um, and, and listening to everything you say at all times every day Ooh. and streaming it to your mobile device. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the there's a Verge article that we have a link to here that talks about this in, in some more depth. And uh, they do come around to the Microsoft uh, recall uh, as well. Yeah, I think yeah. I, there's... I, I liked the beginning of the Verge article um, where yeah. they refer to this uh, image and the screenshot that, that the uh, the the person receives from its AI friend wishing him luck, good luck with the interview. I know you'll, I know you'll nail it, uh, kind of a thing. And that's kind of interesting, but the, uh, having seen what's happened in the AI plus hardware space in the last six months, we can't be anything in my opinion than cynical saying that I am currently wearing a pair of glasses that have access to a yep. large language model and will, also give me, I mean, I, I, I've turned off the always listening feature and I now have to manually um, invoke a gesture to, to invoke it. I was in a, uh, a heritage property today, a national trust property today, and, and I was in a garden and I wanted to identify a plant and I was able to use my glasses to do that. And that was cool. Um, but that was, that was functional. Um, but, and I gather that they're, that they're bringing the, uh, the meta view glasses features to the uh to the um to the quest uh, in the near in the near future so if you've got the most up-to-date quest with the fancy upfront cameras you will be able to do many of the same things that you can do with the uh the regular uh, ray-ban um glasses anywho um yeah i i'm i'm curious to know how this goes see how this goes this is called out much more as an early concept not yet shipping not no pricing, none of those <laughs> kinds of things. The terrifying thing, if you're in tech, is that, oh no, they, I beg your pardon, he does talk about pricing in the article of $99, $99 a piece, but with no, one, yeah. with no one going subscription fee, this will be an important feature of the later in the show. Uh, but <laughs> um, Another well, foreshadowing. You don't need a subscription fee if they're going to mine all the data that you keep talking about the whole but, time. <laughs> And it also kind of Sorry, calls it I out. I got to turn a, off the cynical meter. <laughs> it, it calls it out as kind of like a modern day Tamagotchi as well as a, in, in a sense. Yep. But, um, but the, think about that for a second. That they, well, they, I, I mean, they, just before we do, I want to get to my point here because I'm keep destroying it for myself, uh, which is that they spent all their money uh, on the domain, uh, friend.com. I think they yeah. raised, what, what is it, 1.9 or $2 million and then spent $1.8 million on the domain. Which uh, you know, uh, I think says a lot about the um, approach of the of the founders. But here, well, at, as as soon as I saw this come across, it, it uh, you know I can imagine you talking to it, right? Uh, and it immediately got me going down the thought process of uh, Dulcie Sloan's uh, book, Hello Friends, uh, and and just gabbing away on stuff uh and yeah i i had to try to turn off my cynical meter and and i can't with as you say andy all the things that have happened in the last year around these ar ai hardware devices and the security and and potential data leaks and and everything else about it uh and given that it is designed to basically be something like an air tag with a little glowy screen on it with doesn't give you any information you, it's a mic. It's a, it's a Bluetooth they, microphone. Sh- yeah, but but it's it, a Bluetooth it's microphone more. that has an app on your iPhone. Yeah, but it's yeah. but it's more. But it, the the piece that I was on was think about for a moment. All of these examples we've seen in the last year or less have been a physical representation of what is arguably entirely a cloud service. So, what is it about humans that require to have something that you can hold, show, demonstrate, use to signal to others that it's a thing and you have it, as opposed to all of that service being able to be accessible directly from the phone everybody carries all the time anyway. I mean, shoot, with this example, you're texting with the AI. So in theory, your Bluetooth microphone or your microphone on the phone could act in that way. Why is it that every one of these requires a physical instantiation of something because, 
Do you- because would you pay ninety nine dollars for an app? People well, have, but it's a people, little device. We now physically like, have something. We did that with that. We've talked about that with the rabbit. You know, look, they could yeah. have done this as an yep. Android app. It is an Android app. It's just running on specific hardware. There's nothing particularly special about it. Sorry, sorry, Ian. I know that you're in. in you're a big fan, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I, the, look, the other. It's funny because you mentioned that, Michael, and it has got me thinking about that sort of. The, I mean, obviously, I'm a big fan of physical things. My artwork is all about physical physical things and and and, and the analog nature of of, of reality. Mm-hmm. Um, as much as it it takes in from the digital uh, creation and and the AI pieces, but the um, yeah the, the the notion that we want to have something um, physical, uh, it reminded me. So it got spun my mind off to thinking about Lola, the droid from the Obi Wan Kenobi Disney Plus story, which is uh, Princess Leia's companion. It's more like this. It's more like a little disc. I mean, it right. sits in her. It you know, hovers, her bag, it flies you know. around a little. Well, it has some fun things, like, yeah, it can do a few little fun things. But typically, you know, it's not a fully featured functional walking thing. It's more of a mm-hmm. um, personification of a thing, right? Right. Would, would you need R2D2 if R2D2 could live virtually on your phone and be projected in a hologram form? The answer, Michael, is yes. Yeah, because you couldn't stick yes, into the device and shock people. Stop it. Stop it. I need my my R two D two. Both of you will ruin everything if you carry it. I don't want to. I don't want to completely ruin everything. I mean, I I was an early adopter of the. <laughs> you want to completely the, ruin the, the everything. Cube. You just want to completely ruin some. No, things no, no. Or it's ruin yeah. everything. If this is an exploration, partially. Michael, it, of <laughs> the physicality of these things, yeah. right? People crave that, right? The fidget cube was what, what I was going oh, to yeah. next. I yeah. was an early adopter yeah. of that. Loved it. I love the ability to kind of mess around with it and and just enjoy it for the the button pressing and the, the mean, satisfaction I've, I've you still, get. I've still got my uh, little uh, D twenty or whatever this is, the yeah. D thirty with with all of the little uh, different technology catchphrases on it. It's uh, here. It's just on my desk. It's a fidget device. You know, I don't need it for anything else. I'm going to roll it right now, and it says clear your cache. So let's clear our cache and move on to the next story. Yeah. So let let let's yes. do our our next story is one of um, that that struck me because I've been watching a mm. lot of Olympics, and oh, there yeah. is an advertisement. I don't know if this occurred also in the, in the UK. Well, it, it's specifically a Google and Team C- Team USA story. So I don't think we've been getting this one. And I haven't been watching so much Olympics, and we don't tend to have um, ads running through so much either. So yeah. Ah, okay. Well, yes, it is. It is a U.S. Well, I did see style. The story. Yeah, and yeah. it is. It is one of these things where it's a use case for generative AI to, um, in this situation, help a person write a letter for his daughter to send as a fan mail to a sports hero of hers. And th- the first thing that kind of you know just grabbed me with this was. Um, Gosh, wouldn't you want to help your daughter actually sit down and write a letter if you're going to write a letter? And yes, certainly you can accelerate that by leveraging a large language model and in this case using Google's Gemini service. Um, But the article takes it through in, in lots more detail. And since the article initially ran, I haven't seen it quite as much anymore. I've seen other Google ads in the meantime. And so this was a solution in search of a problem. It found a problem and it created, at least in my mind, an ick factor that as a dad, if I want to help my daughter do something, do I really want to outsource that to something else and then say, Hey, look, daughter, I've now (laughs) typed a prompt into a web page and look what you get (laughs) off you go. Now I'd I'd love it. Definitely the wrong lesson. I'd love it. If the, uh, if the daughter sent the fan letter saying sincerely daughter's name at the end, that would be great (laughs) because that would, that would really demonstrate their care and interest in the athlete. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or, you know, get a yeah, stable definitely, diffusion definitely, uh, artwork yeah. from the daughter, right? You know, like, you know, here's here's my well, drawing of you. And, and on that note, I wrote a blog post this week uh, uh, because this has come up a couple of times recently about uh, the use of AI creatively um, because there was a – it's it's quite common when the term generate or generative artwork or algorithmic – comes up that people assume that the computer has done it and that there is no 
human uh, element to, especially in in, the, in terms of generative art or create in the creative space. So I wrote a piece this week, so try, seeking to separate generative AI, uh, i.e., LLMs, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. from the uh, use of uh, algorithms or or algorithmic or procedural art, um, because I think that was also something that is beginning to blur, well, has definitely blurred in many people's minds because they, they hear yeah. the term generative AI, AI and or, or just hear the term generative and immediately it connects the term AI and they believe that everything's just been done um, by stealing somebody else's work and done for them, you know. So, yep. uh, yeah, little another, another little sidetrack because, you know, I'd love to throw those in here. Yeah. Quite understandable, and it and it fits nicely with the next article here too, which deals with uh, the the traps that can be set to help to see whether or not copyright holders um, have their work incorporated into those training data sets that we've been talking about for a while. I, I love the image on this. this. is one of these MIT technology uh, review articles, and it has a bear trap with a big C, meaning copyright. And uh, the notion here is that you can use these copyright traps by ensuring that as large language models and training that goes against those models, even after that they've gone through their initial versions, can now be used to prompt a response that will demonstrate and show that data that was not licensed, not approved, not agreed to is included. Now, we've talked about this already a few times. Um, This doesn't feel exactly like it's majorly new news here because it's a cat and mouse game of, yes, I can try to sneak something in under the wire that the training data set is not smart enough to detect is a full few sentences of gibberish that michael i I mean this article is more a concept article to me right because the example that they give is is kind of a very obvious example that if you're going to do training of data uh, this would just be exposed quite easily as being something that is trying to cause an ingestion issue right yeah uh, the fact that they're using the same repeated uh, text hundreds or thousands of times uh, would be something quite easily catchable. Uh, and as you say, the cat and mouse game. But I think the, the more important thing is the concept of, of how do you get the appropriate agreements in place and algorithms in place so that only things that are allowed to be captured and consumed can be captured and consumed right and the fact that it is a cat and mouse game right now just says we don't have those in the place yet so right now we're we're fighting it out in these little skirmishes to try to figure out how to do it until there is the appropriate uh regulatory or standards or whatever approach that's in place to to handle it appropriately yeah and to me this is open source on a on a much broader scale right Uh, uh, one of the things that we do for our um our environment here for show notes and that sort of thing is i always go and look for a good picture to try to tell a little bit of a story of our podcast and i always look on unsplash Mm -hmm. or pexels or one of these services where people who have purported to bring their images and make them available, do so under a Creative Commons kind of license, right? So that mm-hmm. way we're, we're doing what we're doing. Uh, we always give credit to where credit is due. So we're pointing back to the person who created said image and put it on the service so you can go back and find it. And we really appreciate all those people doing that. Uh, cat and mouse, <laughs> cat and mouse. All right, we've got one more thing to do before we we wind up our story. And so speaking of mice, um, Michael, you certainly had a, a, a visceral reaction to the idea of having a forever Logitech mouse. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I didn't have, uh, I'll confess ahead of time, I didn't have time to read this long article, uh, but Andy gave a good summary in our in our prep meeting beforehand, and, and you know, turning uh, a mouse into yet another uh, mouse as a service, for lack of better Mass. term, you know, blank as a service tool, um, uh, I... I know the rules, right? I know how this goes, right? You buy a 
premium device with the promise of as a service over time and it'll be updated, blah, 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 blah. And then a few later, years later, there'll be the upgraded premium device. It's a new service, right? And a new service. And so my, again, my cynical nature, which started at the beginning of this show and is going to wrap up nicely on this show. Uh, Didn't is, start then. Yeah, not really. <laughs> well, <laughs> definitely not in my thing. To, so the, all of this news cycle around Logitech uh, and their new-ish CEO uh, talking about this quote-unquote forever mouse um, has stemmed from this uh, this interview that uh, she, uh, Hanneke Faber, gave to The Verge. The reason the article is long is because it's a full transcript of the podcast. Um, yep. But this has been picked up and spun and spun by other outlets. And yeah, this idea that... They want to, they aspire to building this very durable device, this very high end device, and that you may pay for new features in software over time. I am currently looking at my one of my two Logitech mice. This is the one I have at home. It's getting a bit gunky, um, as mice do, because you've got your hand on them. Yep. Um, some people use trackpads, some people uh, use roll up balls or, or other devices. Some use both. <laughs> anyway, I recently, um, in fact, oh, I think it was on the show, uh, talked about the fact that they'd added an AI builder to the, to my mouse, which yep. wasn't useful. Yep. Then it turned out it was because you absolutely need that. Adding lots of nonsense to my lap, my computer in the background and and destroying my uh, uh, disk and CPU and all those other things. So I got rid of it. Um, yeah, I think this is. Um, I, I I found a link. I found somebody talking about it on Macedon and basically saying that this is. You know, this is rent seeking. This is a classic investor model of how can we continue to milk the thing that you've got here? You've you've got a market leading position, or a very you know a very strong saturation in the market. How do you make more money from your existing customers? Um, and I feel so empty thinking about this whole kind of an idea. And I think it's right that people are kind of ridiculing it. And I think that it will go away as a result of being ridiculed as a result of that interview. But we shall see. Hopefully. Well, friends, I think we need to leave it there for this episode of Games at Work.biz because we got places to be and friends to see. So thanks you all for listening, and we'll be back again soon. Bye. See ya. You've been listening to Games at Work.biz, the podcast about gaming technology and play. We are part of the Blueberry Podcasting Network and would like to thank the band Random Encounters for their song, Big Blue. You can follow us at our website at gamesatwork.biz. 